I think it's personally very annoying when we still express shock at like, ooh, this video game has good narrative. I'm like, um, why did you expect it not to have good narrative? We should just go in expecting every video game to have good narrative. Like, we shouldn't be surprised when it does, because that's like, that just brings our field lower. Welcome to Pixel Therapy, the video game podcast where we look at the games we play through the lens of the player, where what you play is just as important as how you play it, and where emotional intelligence is a critical stat. Every other week, we bring on a guest who may or may not consider themselves a gamer to discuss one of the games that made them and changed them, and all the feelings they have about our favorite pastime. I'm your co-host Jamie, pronouns she, her. And I'm your co-host Spencer, pronouns they, them. And this is Pixel Therapy, so pull up an armchair, feel free to lie down on the couch, and let's talk about our feelings. Spencer, we're going to start with some housekeeping again. <laughs> Do you sit with the feather duster? That's right. <laughs> uh, first, we want to start with our monthly shout out for November Patreon support, uh, which goes to Adayinka Araromi. Thank Thanks, you. Yinka. Thank you so much. You're a real one. Uh, we really appreciate your support on Patreon. If you're listening to this and you want to get your name in the credits, uh, come check out patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod and join us at the $8 tier or above. And we'll give you a special monthly shout out to you. But we should also mention that even if, you know, $8 seems like more cups of coffee than you'd like to spend in a month, which I totally get. Um, we also have tiers as low as $2 um, yes. where we're putting um, monthly bonus co-op mode episodes, which are just me and Jamie kind of like diving into different gaming topics. Um, We use these funds to help us sustain our practice of compensating all our guests and artists. And so um, if you want to come check out our little baby community on Patreon, that's a thing you can do. Yeah, just two weeks old, just two weeks old. So come over to Patreon, check us out. And maybe uh, hit that subscribe button and you can get just more of me and Spencer if that's, <laughs> if that's something you're interested like in. Like Yinka. Be like Yinka. <laughs> <laughs> be, be like Yinka. <laughs> All right. Uh, but but yeah, seriously, though, you know, we launched a, the Patreon two weeks ago. We have a few Patreon supporters. Thank you Thank to everyone you. who's supporting on Patreon. Thank you even if you're not supporting on Patreon, if you're just listening to the show, yeah. if you're commenting on social media, if you're taking a picture of listening to the podcast and posting on social media, if you're giving us reviews, uh, we see all of that and we appreciate it so, so much. No matter and- how much you pay, we are still gay for you. We love you. <laughs> yes, 100%. Uh, now, enough of that sappy shit. Spencer, what are you playing? Oh, my God. Well, you said no more sappy shit, but I'm sorry. I have to get right back into the sappy no, shit. No, I know. Really, like, this are, like the sappy shit doesn't end on Pixel Therapy. <laughs> oh, my God. It's, it's right in the name. But, okay. So, <laughs> this morning, I got up at 5, like I, like I do. Um, thanks, Anxiety. Um, and I thought <laughs> <laughs> that I would finish a game that I've been, it's been kind of a saga. Um, so I just finished God of War 2018. I know, I know, I'm late to the party. I get it. Um, but I mean, it's timely because um, our friends at Sony just announced that, um, and our, our, our best friends at Santa Monica Studio um, announced that they there would be a God of War sequel um, to the one that came out in 2018. It's called it be God of War Ragnarok. Um, and so I'm very excited for that in 2021 mm-hmm. on my PS5. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I um, uh, we'll, we'll get more <laughs> into it. But essentially, if you've never played God of War, um, it's a game. I mean, Kratos and God of War, I feel like, have largely been synonymous with PlayStation in the past decade. Like, it's, it's yeah. a really, like, defining um, series for the platform. Um, But essentially you play as Kratos um, and he is a Spartan demigod. um, And the way that he became a god um, was actually that he was tricked by the God of War, Ares, um, into killing his own family. Um, And obviously a very traumatic experience, um, but really Kratos' story is one of vengeance. Um, I, so personally, (laughs) I never played the first um, three games, um, but... Oh, there's more than three. How many there's, are there? Like there's like there's three numbered titles, and then there's at least three or four other like side stories. There's there, 
uh the god of war games have an extensive history on playstation yeah yeah and like i think that Okay, so again, I didn't play the earlier titles, but um, so early 2000s, I guess I'm going to betray myself a little bit here, but I was like in elementary school, like of second grade. A little uh, baby. I was a little baby when the, the first like God of War games were coming out. And like, <laughs> I was telling Jamie earlier, like, I used to have nightmares about Kratos. Like, um, I think his size and the gruffness of his voice, he and especially- the characterization of his rage, um, like it was something that pretty much personified all of the things that like childhood me was dealing with in a very real way with my like alcoholic stepfather and like my abusive, uh, like abusive interactions I was having with my stepmother. And like, I just, I would have nightmares of his big, like white and red and angry, his face. Cause he has these big, uh, like red tattoos. Kratos does, um, not my stepdad. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, the games really glorified, um, like it was, I would say it's very John Wick esque in the fact that, um, you know, this terrible, terrible thing has befallen Kratos at the very beginning of this. Uh, of his adventure. And so it sort of is used to justify his war path of revenge. And like the games were very hack and slash. So um, like when I watched people playing, like what stood out to me the most was the blood and the almost like gleefulness with which you would be like literally bashing people's faces in. Um, And it it made me really uncomfortable. um, And it made me, uh, it just put me in that kind of primal place that I would fall into when um for example like i'd hear my parents fighting and knew that there was nothing i could do about it like i just didn't think that that was something i would want to get from a game and similarly i saw kratos as a monster um which i think is really interesting because of my relationship to the 2018 um (laughs) installment of the game um but i didn't want to give him the time of day i didn't want to get to know him as a person because i felt like um the way that the game was marketed and the way um, that it was talked about, it was like the things that were glorified about the game were the violence you were able to commit and the capacity of destruction that you were able to do and the way that you were absolutely, uh, you know, just punishing people. And um, anyway, I want to pause there because you actually played it, Jamie, and I was wondering if maybe you wanted to share um, some of your perspective on the first few titles before we get into talking about um, God of War 2018. Yeah, sure. Um, Yeah, so I was, I'd have to look at the exact years, but I think I was in like junior high, early high school um, when the God of War game started coming out. At the very least, that's when I played the first one on my Mm -hmm. PlayStation 2. And uh, yeah, so like as I've played, I couldn't, I couldn't give you the list of all the games off the top of my head because like I said, there's, there's several of them. Um, but I have played all of the God of War games over the years as they came out. It's been one of my favorite franchises um, from PlayStation during that time. I think everything you're saying about it as being this like, like the glorifying of the violence, I think it's absolutely there. Like, I'm not here to say like, oh, you totally misunderstood. And there's like mm-hmm. this really heartfelt narrative at the center <laughs> of this game. Like, no, Kratos is a monster. Uh, He's portrayed as a monster. When I first uh, got into these games, one of the things that drew me to them was the the world building. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I was really into it. It's still really like Greek mythology, but was really into it at that age, junior high, going into high school. Uh, Greek mythology just seems so cool. I remember there was like this series of books I got at the library, and each one was about a different Greek monster, Cerberus and the Gorgons and Mm. like just devouring all that stuff and being so into it. And here was a world that had those. I mean, you fight Gorgons and you fight Cerberus dogs and you chop their heads off. And (laughs) it's all, yes, there's a ton of blood and violence that's, um, that's really glorified, but it, I, having played them, I would say it all feels somewhat cartoonish. Mm. Um, and even Kratos is a bit of a cartoon. Like he literally, just yells everything that he says. <laughs> the, those entire games are just a personification of rage. Like mm-hmm. it's literally just, but to a cartoonish level that it doesn't even feel 
real. It's just yeah. uh, he is just an, a force of nature. Mm. He he goes through everything and he destroys everything that he goes through. Mm. Um, and it is a venge a vengeance quest. Um, he was tricked, as you say, mm. into killing his family. Although, as I've gotten older and kind of looked back on the narrative and something that I don't think the 2018 God of War like does this explicitly right but in that game he is a he's a much sadder figure Mm -hmm. he's someone who feels regret for the actions of his previous life and i think you know looking back at like the narrative that they told about kratos and the way he placed blame for the death of his family on Ares, the god of war Mm -hmm. he it was his fault he was in a bloodlust and he was murdering innocent people in this town Yes, it was at the behest of Ares that he was sent to the town, but he was there doing it, murdering innocent people, busted into a church and murdered his own wife and daughter because he was in such a state that he didn't even realize what he was doing. Mm. And he places that blame on Ares, but it's on him. Yeah. Um, and to some extent, the third game, God of War 3, wrestles with that a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. But they've yeah, they've never been the deepest games. I think something that drew me to them at that younger age is that I did have a bit of an anger problem Mm. when I was younger. Um, And I would say kind of up through maybe early college. Uh, I kind of thought that being an asshole and like slamming doors and yelling was a good way to get my point across and like an Mm. appropriate way to deal with my feelings some of that I think I got from my dad. That's kind of how he yeah. has embodied anger. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so when I felt vulnerable or scared, that was how I would manifest that. Um, if I felt overwhelmed, that's how I would manifest that. And so something about like Kratos being just this like sheer driven force of rage um, resonated. And similarly, like playing the 2018 game and seeing how he has like uh, managed that and learned not to just destroy everything in front of him as a way to deal with his problems. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. That resonated. That like journey of growth resonated with me a lot um, because I definitely saw that in myself at a younger age. And and like to a certain point, I was glorifying that too. I was right. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, not that I ever like had the conscious thought of like, well, Kratos deals with his problems by just <laughs> destroying things. So I'm going to deal with my problems by just destroying so things. But like, I thought that that was badass and cool. And now right. I see that it's like childish and doesn't really get you anywhere. Mm. Um, so yeah, so it was kind of cool to see that, have that growth mirrored a little bit. And I don't think I'm alone in that journey. I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of people who probably played the earlier games and played 2018 God of War and like felt that growth. I think it's um, if you listen to Corey Barlog, the game director talk, that's something that like he wanted to bring to the story. Mm -hmm. Um, Something that he himself had experienced a growth like that of being like immature and young Mm -hmm. and thinking like that rage is a good way to deal with your problems. And then kind of growing out of that as you get older. When you burn through it. You're left picking up the pieces, what's left mm-hmm. of it anyway, of yourself, of your relationships. Um, well, and you realize it's just a, it's literally just a defense mechanism, right? It's just a wall to protect you from trying to feel vulnerable. And when you understand that, like, vulnerability is how you can make connections with people. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know. Rage yeah. does, you know, it only postpones any pain that you might mm. be feeling. It doesn't actually... It's not actually a balm for it. Mm -hmm. Great point. (laughs) Sorry, I just wanted to (laughs) sit with that for a moment. Also, slight (laughs) slight correction. Um, So the original God of War came out in 2005. So I was in the fourth grade, not the second grade. There you Um, go. But yeah, I was still having nightmares, I guess. Judge me. Um, (laughs) I still have nightmares to this day. Yeah, Not about Kratos, but (laughs) I don't think people grow out of nightmares. Yeah, oh, God. especially now. Um, <laughs> um, Living a nightmare. LOL. Life is the nightmare. Um, <laughs> but, oh yeah, so just for a little bit 
so coming coming up to the present, um, or I guess two years ago, God of War 2018, um, just wanted to give a little bit of context on, on this game that I just played. And so um, it's set some time after the events um, of God of War 3, where um, Kratos, actually at the end of God of War 3, um, he stabs himself with this giant magical sword. We don't really need to go into the details there. Um, and uh, <laughs> he leaves... Um, Greece. They're in Greece, right? Yeah. Sparta. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so in the events of this game, he's actually in the world of Norse mythology. He's in Midgard. Um, and he has a son named Atreus, who is absolutely amazing and wonderful and charming. Um, and has a little mohawk kind of a thing. Yeah, he does. I love his a little, little haircut. Yeah, he's a little redheaded mohawk. He's got arrows. Um, he can basically like parkour off and like he'll choke enemies with his, uh, with his bow for you. Um, and he's always got your back. Um, like I just, he's like your little buddy. Um, and then Kratos has developed this healthy beard. Um, I don't know if he's aging or if he just looks older because of the big beard, but he definitely seems a little bit. They definitely aged him, little, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's been living in this area for an undeterminate amount of time. Um, he had had a partner, the mother of his son, um, but she has since passed away. And the game opens with the two of you, father and son, um, taking her ashes. Um, you have this mission to t- take her ashes to the tallest peak um, of this mountain. Well, can I pause you one second? Because yeah. the game actually, the opening of this game I will just go. I've restarted this game so many times just oh, yeah, to okay. play the opening like ten minutes mm-hmm. over and over again because I love it so much. First of all, I think it's so fucking cool that you boot up the game and you're on the the opening screen that mm-hmm. has like continue game, start a new game, load, whatever, and it's this image of Kratos with his hand on a tree, on a mm-hmm. white ashen tree that has a gold handprint painted on it. Mm-hmm. And when you click new game, it literally goes right from that screen into the game. There's no, oh, yeah, there's nothing. It just the, <sighs> the words, the words on the screen drop away and you realize you're watching Kratos stand here, look sadly at this tree. Mm-hmm. Then he cuts the fucking tree down, mm-hmm. <laughs> just carries the tree one handed, <laughs> like over to the water. You meet That's Atreus. Yeah. And they quietly row the tree. Uh, back to their house. They're like on a on a river. They row it down the river back to their home and add it to the pile of wood that they have there. And Atreus runs into the house and it, the camera like follows him into the house and you're in like a cinematic now, like a cutscene. Mm-hmm. And he's saying this prayer over his mother's dead body that's like wrapped up in cloth and like laying on the table. And that that whole scene and then the way the music He's saying the prayer and he finishes the prayer and Kratos opens the door behind him and the music is like, bum, bum. And they carry the body <laughs> out and put it on the pyre and yeah. watch it start burning. That, yeah. all of that is yeah. like chills every fucking time I play it. And I've probably like done it like 10 times. And it's yeah. just like this little 10 minutes of like introing you to the game, letting you mm-hmm. meet these two characters and yeah, Before Baldur know. shows up and completely fucks up your shit. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> but but yeah. yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Thank you for taking us there because um, it's been a few hundred hours since I last experienced that opening. And yeah, I was struck immediately because I mean, Jamie basically talked about God of War to me but for two years, 2018 to 2020, because <laughs> every few months I'm like, oh, woe is me. I don't know what to play. I've played Persona 5 for the third time. Uh, like, what can I What can I do? There's nothing to do. And Jamie's like, God of War, I got to try God of War. And well, and I like, just... <laughs> so you had shared with me, like, kind of your history with the series and why yeah. you didn't, why you wanted to kind of avoid it. And so I didn't want to push too hard. Hard, but I knew that this game was so dramatically different from those other <laughs> ones. So I'd just be like, well, you know, if you're interested, like, if you think maybe like you might give it a shot, uh, you know, there's God of War 2018. I don't know. It's just the best game. One of the best games I've ever played. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like if if you have a moment, uh, you know, no pressure. <laughs> Check it you out whenever. You never tried to push me. You never, you never tried to do it before I was ready, Jamie. You always are there for me. 
(laughs) (laughs) But yeah, like uh, it took me a long time. And then essentially I was playing the game earlier this year and then I had to get hand surgery and the only game I could play one handed was the last of us two. So shout out to (laughs) the last of us two accessibility features. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, yeah, so the game opens, um, and yes, right away I was sort of struck by, the, uh, first of all, I mean, the game is just very cinematic in a way that still feels really organic. Like, like even games like Ghost of Tsushima, and oh my god, I always gotta mention that goddamn game. But like games <laughs> Take that Take a I, drink every time <laughs> Spencer mentions Ghost of Tsushima. I, know, I feel like I mention it at least <laughs> once in like every episode, but, um, <laughs> um, I just feel like the seamless, seamlessness is that a word seamlessness yeah, seamlessness of the transitions seamless. and um just the epic the scale of the world around you and um how you simultaneously are this powerful god but you're also so small in this world and um mm. just the, the, how just communicating the scale of, of certain things and i mean it's just a breathtaking game but um more than that i oh sorry go ahead Oh no, I was just going to say, well, I had, I started it again the other night because you've been talking about Mm. it and I was just like, "Ah, I'm going to play it again. Um, and I was just, you know, this game's two years old, but I think graphically it still really holds up. Yeah. Like the, the attention to detail in the game, especially on the character models, like the Mm -hmm. fur on Atreus's, uh, like tunic, the leather of Kratos's, uh, like, Uh, shoulder band all of that stuff is so carefully detailed even like the back of kratos's head his like Mm -hmm. bald head and you can see all the lines of his his muscles and his skin yeah um but the sound design i feel like really gives a weight Mm -hmm. to the characters that's what i was noticing you know like you pick up that tree and the way it sounds as you pick it up Mm -hmm. you can feel the weight of the tree yeah when kratos moves you can feel that he's this like kind of heavy lumbering Mm -hmm. character in the world because of the way they give the sounds of his feet on the ground yeah he walks into the cabin the way the cabin floor echoes under his steps Mm -hmm. it's all like really subtle but you were saying how seamless all the transitions are and i i wonder if you knew this the um the game got a lot of credit for being done uh, it's like all in one shot Mm. is what they said there's (gasps) no there's everything is everything is seamless as you said so literally oh. it goes it goes into cinematics without cuts there's no yeah. cuts <gasps> in the game throughout the entire game which was like a huge achievement um when they did it and such a small thing that they put a ton of work into but i feel like makes it really makes a difference you feel like you're playing a movie mm-hmm. and i don't want to like say like this is the only way to make a game mm-hmm. like Obviously, we've talked about a ton of different types of ga- types of games. They're all really valid, but getting a game like that, like there's just something really special about what they were able to do with this game and that level of craft. That you they feel were able the to love. Put into it. Yeah, yeah. It feels like love. Like it feels like redemption. So when you were just talking about how you could see for the back of Kratos's head, like all the lines of his musculature and his skin and stuff. I have to admit, I got a little turned on. Kratos could get it. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty hot. He's pretty hot. <laughs> oh yeah. And um, so the sound design, like the, the weight of the chain, like the sound of all the chains around his wrists and the clanking of his weapons clanking together. And when mm-hmm. you talked about him lumber, like, yeah, you can really feel the weight of his body. Um, and it, I've never really been that aware of my presence in a game before. Mm, Um, mm -hmm. and that really subtle sound design just really made him feel that much more real to me. Um, yeah, I think too, like, I just, I've never felt so, um, like I felt emotionally invested, but I, I think, I think in previous games too, like you're used to thinking of Kratos as this unstoppable force, but I was so afraid for him throughout the entire game. Um, Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know what I, maybe because of Atreus and his concern for Kratos, like how he's, he's all, he's there with you in fights and he's always yelling like, father, look out. Like someone's about to attack you. Or like, if you get killed in a fight, Atreus is able to resurrect you. And it's a very like uh, intense moment where Kratos falls and Atreus um, falls atop you and is frantically um, drawing a rune on your chest. Um, uh, and then he slams the, uh, 
Like the health stone, right? Yeah, the resurrection stone into your chest and you like <gasps> like come back to life in this kind of like uh almost like when someone does the electric pads when someone has a mm-hmm. heart attack. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like a defi- yeah, defibrillator or, or like an adrenaline shot. Yeah, yeah. Um it's just it's very visceral. Um it's very much a story about, you know, these epic battles and and overcoming these odds to get to your goal. Um but really um the focus of the story is the relationship between Atreus and Kratos. Um, and I think at the beginning, um, still very much informed by my previous, uh, let's say, predisposition for disliking Kratos, I very much mm-hmm. did not trust him. Um, mm-hmm. I was very defensive of Atreus from the, from the start. I felt this um, kinship with him and I was very distrusting from Kratos, even though I was him. Um, and in the beginning, like y- you haven't seen anything about the relationship between these two up until this point, um, but you get the sense very early on that Kratos has not been a big part in Atreus's life up until this point. Um, mm-hmm. There's these comments about how he'd always be off hunting. Um, he'd never really be around. He doesn't even call Atreus by his name. He just calls him boy. Mm-hmm. Boy, read this. Boy, like defend yourself. Boy, get ready. Um, and he's very much just barking orders at his son throughout the first uh, portion of the game. And, and very slowly over the course of the game, um, like you do get closer and, and you get to a point where, you know, Kratos has to come to terms with the fact that if he doesn't want, if truly he hates all gods and in turn himself and he doesn't want his son to be anything like him, treating him the way that he's doing now, continuously pushing him away, um, disregarding him, not, not allowing him to, to help you to, to talk to you, um, like being unemotional like this, like it's, it's just going to create, it's just going to perpetuate that cycle of violence and that cycle of um, alienation that Kratos felt from his own father, Zeus and BP. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> who, but, who he uh, killed. Uh, who he killed. Yes. Yeah. Which, which is a, a narrative point in the game Mm -hmm. um, of the fact that like, I, I, you know, I think it's important to mention that Kratos has really like hid who he is Mm -hmm. from Atreus. It's, it's uh, suggested that the, the mother knew Faye, right. Mm -hmm. That she knew who Kratos was Mm -hmm. in his previous life. She knew. But but Atreus at the, in the first portion of the game doesn't even know, Kratos is a god. Mm-hmm. Um, Kratos has such a, a huge amount of shame and like self-loathing for what he's done and who he is that he does not um, bring. Like he has not shared any of that with Atreus, and he hides it from from everyone. Yeah. Um, and so this is—it's very much a game of like learning to. I see a few different things in it, right? It's like it's like Kratos learning to accept himself mm-hmm. and understanding that only in accepting himself can he actually be a father figure for Atreus, right? Like he's got to reckon with his own mistakes. He can't continue to hate himself the way he does and actually be able to be compassionate and like be a father to his son if he doesn't reconcile with his own past first. Mm-hmm. And so that's like, that's a big aspect of the game that I think really resonated with me of like, yeah, learning to accept who you are, flaws and all, accept that you've changed and then try to like lean into that change and continue to be a better person. Yeah. And the fact that we can continue to grow better. There's this refrain throughout um, about how, you know, once Kratos does come clean to Atreus about his past, he says, um, you know, Atreus says, you know, is, is this what it means to be a god? Is this all there is? Violence, you know, sons killing fathers, sons killing their mothers, brothers killing siblings, like destruction, pain. Um, and Kratos says, you know, no, like, no, we have to do better. You have to be better than me um, about, you know, being better gods, better fathers, better sons, better people. Um I think that, like we talked about earlier, um, this game definitely takes a departure in terms of recognizing that beyond violence, um, what th- what happens when the violence is over? Like, um, mm-hmm. 
when the hero's journey is done, um, what's left. And um, I think Kratos has definitely, up until this point, maybe lived a life where he wasn't thinking about the future. Um, he was just thinking about getting to the end. Um, and now that he has a legacy, it's like, um, it's just, it was beautiful. I, I, I felt like this game was sort of, it was the perfect time for me to play it. And um, I think knowing what I knew about God of War previously and how I felt about Kratos, like just as much as he was proving himself to Atreus, I also felt like uh, he was changing his relationship with me. Like I oh, wow. am a Kratos stan <laughs> now. I, I love this man. <laughs> um, I think like late in the game, as you were Taught, as you were alluding to earlier, um, there's a scene where the two of you are cast down into the pits of Helheim, which is basically like the North's hell. Um, it's mm-hmm. like really cold um, and icy. And there are these visions that come to you in the winds um, of memories that you've had in your life or regrets or things that you lost. And that's how the souls in Helheim are tortured. And mm-hmm. so, um, um, in earlier games, um, Kratos actually killed his father, Zeus. Um, and what, as he and Atreus are escaping Helheim, um, these, ga- these ghostly specters come in the form of Zeus and Kratos. Um, and in front of the two of them, uh, Atreus sees his father killing Zeus. Um, mm-hmm. And Kratos sees it too. And the, and I mean, I think this speaks to just the, the quality of, the acting and, and everything about this game, but the brokenness in his voice uh, when when he re- he just turns to Atreus and says like you saw, but the way that he says you saw was full of so much pain and fear. Like I'd never heard Kratos afraid, but in that moment, I really felt like just his fear that his son might reject him, or maybe just the idea that his son might think of him as a monster too, or, or, or just having that laid bare. Um, it was devastating to him. And I saw, I started to really understand him better in that moment. I think like, mm-hmm. I think up until that point, I was comfortable saying like, Oh, he's so gruff and keeps Atreus at arm's length because he thinks Atreus is weak. And it's like, no, he thinks he himself is weak. He thinks that he himself does not deserve to be here. Um, And so, I don't know. I was just really moved. And I think like, I feel like that right there is like the nut of what had probably always drawn me to Kratos, right? Like all of that rage that I exhibited at a younger age, like all of that, like it's really just masking a like deep uh, self-loathing mm-hmm. and like fear of putting myself out there and getting hurt, putting mm-hmm. myself out there and having anyone say, see the real me who mm-hmm. I think is shit uh, and having anyone else realize that. So if you put on that tough exterior and that shell, then you can protect yourself from that. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, or, I mean, not really, but that's the mindset. Um, and after so- that, it's like he starts to finally. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Were you going to say something more? No, go ahead. I was just going to mention that after that scene, um, you start to notice that Kratos starts actually touching Atreus. Like he'll put his hand on his shoulder. Um, mm-hmm. There, he chuckles for the first time. Like he actually mm-hmm. smiles in response to something Atreus has said. Um, he starts to do things like <laughs> it, it's always. Like, I like the scenes where. Like Kratos will just single handedly like pick up a giant fallen wall or boulder or something that has fallen <laughs> in the way. Um, but he says, like, come on, Atreus, like help me. And and you feel you're like, that's a total parent, that's a total dad moment, because you know that Atreus little he's like a little ten year old boy, his little spaghetti arms aren't <laughs> lifting shit. But just he's being a father. Like he's, he's And he's he's trying. He's like making an uh, like and I don't I maybe that's such a low bar to say like, oh, he's making an effort. But as someone who has like struggled so hard to like demonstrate any vulnerability like that, like I know that those little gestures mm-hmm. from someone who's been in like that mindset are so fucking hard because every time he does that, 
like he could he could ask Atreus to come help and Atreus could say like no that's dumb you don't need my help Mm -hmm. and then like there's real fear of that Mm -hmm. if you're someone who has that kind of mindset so like those gestures might seem small but they're tough when you Mm -hmm. have so much like loathing of yourself and think so little of yourself Mm -hmm. and I think too from that same concept from like another perspective of like as a parent like I think children adult children of parents who maybe have strained relationships with their parents like you can you can try again and again to communicate to your parent you know how what they've done has hurt you why what they've done has hurt you how they could change their behavior to treat you better um just mm-hmm. try to establish boundaries with parents and have that all be ignored um and so for a child to give feedback to a parent and for that parent to actually internalize that feedback and change i think mm-hmm. that that's a really important uh, thing to model in this game. Mm-hmm. Like, like, no, parents aren't infallible. They're not always right. They don't deserve respect just because they're older than you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, like there's a lot of lessons here too for, for, I mean, obviously this game is for parents. <laughs> it's not for the, ki- it's not for the Atreuses of the world, but I, but it's be- I think it's beautiful and, and important. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I think the voice acting in this is huge too. I think like this game, so much of this game, what makes this game special is a sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. It's got, I think really well-written dialogue between the characters. It's that the subtle sound design, the level of detail, the seamlessness, ness, seamlessness, ness. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe it's not a word. I don't know. (laughs) You just, you just say seamless and then you keep going. S S S S. Yeah. Until there's no seams. There's no seam. Um, but the the voice acting, I think, is huge, too. You were kind of talking about, like, how that uh, you saw line is delivered. And in the bit that I was playing earlier this week when I restarted it, there's, um, you know, a, near the beginning of the game, Balder comes to the house looking for, well, you think that he's looking for Kratos. Um, you eventually learn that it's a little bit of this game is like a mistaken identity thing. Um but Balder shows up, him and Kratos fight. While they're fighting, Kratos hi- has Atreus hide under the floorboards of the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kratos wins the fight. Uh, he goes and gets Atreus, and, and they set off uh, towards the mountain to scatter Faye's ashes. And Atreus uh, sees all the destruction that was left behind from the fight. And he says to, he's like asking Kratos all these questions, and Kratos is like being gruff and like giving him one word answers. And then Atreus is like, never leave me alone again, okay? And Kratos says, okay. But the way that he says it, you can hear like this little smile in his voice of like recognizing that his son was like scared for him. And like all the other answers were so like, yes, no, okay, boy. And then it's like, okay. Oh my God, I missed that. That's it's (laughs) it's literally one word. And it's just Christopher Judge, who plays uh, Kratos, just gives an amazing performance in this game. He does so much with like so little. You hear so much emotion in these like very brief answers. You really uh, do. Yeah. I don't know. I love the game. I th- like I only wish it was a bit shorter so I could play through it more often. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cuz mm-hmm. I really I've never completed a second playthrough. I usually run out of steam somewhere mm-hmm. around the midpoint, but I it's the kind of game that I almost want to experience like a movie that you watch annually. Like I want to come back to it and revisit it. And that's kind of the only like downside to games is that for the most part, they're too long Mm -hmm. to really do that with. Um, Yeah. But yeah, it's healing. Um, And yeah, in that ending scene, like, uh, so you find out just to kind of tie the bow, but you find out that Atreus (laughs) His real or the name that his mother wanted to give him was Loki. Um, And he is, I mean, he's a trickster god we all know and love, but he's also kind of like the harbinger of Ragnarok, which is like the end of days. Um, And, uh, you know, Kratos kind of chuckles and is like, oh, Loki, like that's the name your mother wanted to give you. I was the one who wanted to name you Atreus. And throughout the game, you know, you're learning all about this Norse mythology. You're learning all about the, the panth, like the gods and um, the history of the land. And the whole time, you know, Kratos, because he hates gods, just kind of like, mm, I don't care about this. Like, whatever. <laughs> like, he doesn't give a fuck. Um, 
at the end, I, you know, Atreus asked him, like, well, why did you give me that name? And uh, Kratos tells the story of um, what back when he was um, a Spartan, um, Atreus was the name of a fellow warrior, someone who no matter how dire things were, like he was always smiling. He always was happy. He, um, he lifted the spirits of others. And when he died, he ended up saving a ton of other people um, in the process. And so um, he was someone that um, Kratos said that he still like, some of his fondest memories are when he's, when he needs comfort, he thinks about Atreus. Um, and so like, you know, I think that right there, that little reveal at the end just goes to show you that even at the beginning of the game, when we didn't know more about what was going on inside Kratos's head, it's like, he's always loved his son um, and wanted something better for him. Yeah. And blessed him with a name like that. One hundred percent. Well, we've been talking about a game with a great narrative. <laughs> Listen, I could talk for another hour about God of War. Yeah, no, me too. Um, but I think we should transition now into our guest interview. Guess if we have to for this week. <laughs> Uh, I promise we actually want to do a podcast with guest interviews. <laughs> like every, every every episode, we're like, I guess we should transition now. Um, but we just love talking about video games. Uh, but our, our guest this week is Cece Zhang, a narrative designer and video game writer. Uh, they've also written articles featured on sites like Kotaku, Polygon, Vice Games, Bullet Points Monthly. Uh, and they single-handedly created the game Lion Killer which got nominated for the Excellence in Narrative Award at the 2020 Independent Games Festival. Kind of a big deal. Yeah, kind of a big deal. I think you wanted to say a bit more about Lion Killer? Yeah, so we talk a bit about Lion Killer in the interview with Cece, so we just wanted to give you a little bit more context about it. Um, So Lion Killer is a choose-your-own-adventure game. It's totally text-based, where you play as a young lesbian who is conscripted into the first opium war against the British Empire. You get to do everything from run a flower shop to kiss a girl to uncover a full ass military conspiracy. <laughs> um, interestingly, you know, I mean, I think indicative of the kind of general effed upness of the gaming industry, perhaps um, this game was mm. pretty much overlooked when it was first uh, launched. Um, but in July 2019, CC actually tweeted about how folks who were unhappy about the current at that time Disney live action Mulan movie could choose to support a non-binary Chinese developer instead. Um, and that tweet, timely as it was, um, went a little bit viral and brought a bunch of well, well-deserved attention to the game. Um, so you can find more about this game. Um, you can just Google like Lion Killer game. Lion Killer is one word. Um, you can also find the game and download it on itch.io. It's I-T-C-H dot I-O. It's like a, a game for a, a, a website uh, for indie games. Mm-hmm. Um, and but essentially, you know, this is a, a really cool um, text-based game. Um, CC is a really thoughtful, um, talented writer um, and designer. Um, you should definitely check it out. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, but we really just really enjoyed having the opportunity um, to, you know, we're always talking about video game narratives and stories and our emotional mm-hmm. connections to them in this podcast. Um, but it was cool to actually be able to hear the perspective of someone who actually designs those narratives themselves um, mm-hmm. about what makes a good narrative um, and their experiences kind of navigating the industry. Yeah, yeah. And uh Quite unfortunately, we did have some tech issues with this interview, so it's a little short, but we'll catch you on the flip side of the interview, and we'll fill you in um, with some more info when we get on the other side of it. So without further ado, here's our interview with Cece Zhang. Hi, Cece. Thank you so much for joining us in the Pixel Therapy Studio. We are so happy to be sharing space with you today. Um, For folks who may not be familiar with your work, uh, could you maybe take a minute to introduce yourself, uh, your pronouns, and say a little bit about what what you're up to, how you spend your time? Okay, cool. Um, I'm Cece, pronouns they, them, and I am a writer and narrative designer on a lot of things. Um, I'm the sole developer behind Lion Killer, which was nominated for the Independent Games Festival Excellence Narrative Award. And I was one of the writers on Signs of Sojourner, which was just nominated for a Golden Joystick Award for storytelling. And um, I'm currently working on a another personal game that um, 
Ooh. is kind of being delayed because there are too many good games coming out right now. And so, like, mm. I do play a lot of games for research, and unfortunately, it really is for research because it is very hard to <laughs> enjoy things fully when you're doing it for work reasons um, and yeah. constantly analyzing <laughs> um, games when you're playing them. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of mm. what's been happening, and it's just really exciting time to be playing narrative games right now because, like, there's just so m- much good stuff going on in this, like, mm-hmm. field. Sorry, so are you saying that you're putting your personal project on hold because there are too many good games to play? And <laughs> Honestly, part of it's also just, like, I am having some engine struggles, and it's just easier to, mm-hmm. like, not <laughs> go jump immediately back on it when <laughs> I'm, like, stuck on some technical issue, and I'm just, like... Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely going back to it, but it's just that, like, right now, also, like, my work is constantly being influenced by what I'm playing, like, to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, th- like, I mean, the design is still pretty locked in because I'm, like, pretty, like, deep into the production process, but it's, like, it's, but it's kind of, like, I, it's kind of, like, I can justify it with, like, you know, actually, like, there's actually some, like, I'm trying to, like, trying to like see what else is going on in the narrative game space so it's all good Mm. yeah yeah cool yeah so let's talk a little bit about uh you know your work as a narrative designer working in this narrative game space um can you speak a little bit about what this art form means to you like what separates narrative design from other forms um, I mean, it's a lot of things. Some people think it's writing. Some people think it's like voiceover stuff. And personally, mm. I disagree. I think that's entirely different. Um, well, I mean, mm. well, it's contentious. Basically, it's contentious. It's um, it's a lot of different things that I'm really hoping that narrative can really become more specialized because we cannot get narrative mm. designers doing like 50 things at once. It can't be the the writer, the level designer, the uh, UI designer, the um, voiceover mm. person. I mean, I think it's important to get narrative on voiceover, but it's just that like there's like five different narrative jobs bundled into one, and I just want there yeah. to be a role that's like that's like um, voiceover narrative designer. You know, like that's what I mean by when mm. I say that it bothers me that like voiceover is narrative design because I think like we should have way more specialized roles for all these sorts of things. Cause if you think about it, if you think about art, right? Like there's 2d artists, there's 3d artists, there's UI artists, there's VFX artists, there's lighting artists. I mean, they have an artist just for the lighting mm-hmm. or like the technical artist. I'm just like, there are like 10 different kinds of artists, but like, even like yeah. in so many, mm-hmm. like the studios, we have like one person doing all of it. And I just think that, like, mm-hmm. I, I'm kind of encouraged when I see a role like technical narrative designer because it shows me that they're, they've put some thought into, like, you actually need people with different specialties and to, like, do this kind of work. But right now I'm still like, well, I guess it's good that they have figured out that writer is a separate job from narrative design in some studios. But it's still kind of like we're it's just still kind of like the uh, – we're still kind of in the – um kind of like in like new space in terms of like what the heck is going on and like do we need more people Mm. for this so we're still figuring it out um yeah and so it's kind of like it's tricky like don't ever start the conversation with like like what's the difference between narrative design and writer because then you will get like a whole lot of like Mm. contradictory (laughs) and uh, um contentious uh (laughs) um debate Right, right. <laughs> you know, like when we hear the word narrative, I think in each, in it, immediately it connotes, you know, this relationship with text and um, like a story, a novel, um, like the very base of, uh, you know, creative storytelling that we use our imagination as the main way of, of interacting with it. Um, what do you think, like when we apply narrative design to something like a video game, which is inherently interactive and sort of... Um, kind of pushes the boundaries of what a narrative can be. Um, like, what do you think this interactivity changes about the way that we engage with narratives? Like, like what does this add to? to I mean, it doesn't have to be text, right? Because if you turn off the subtitles into any video game, like that doesn't automatically mean there's no narrative design in it. Like, mm-hmm. um, 
But I do think that in terms of like in like queer spaces, there's a tendency to think of visual novel because like I think that queer people have a tendency to like not really shun visual novel as a format. Um, so I think that's why there's more credibility given to like text and text boxes. Whereas in like, I guess the more prestige video game space, it's more like, I think there's a lot of pressure on our designers to prove our worth by not doing that lowbrow work with visual novels mm. and by mm. doing the kind of narrative work that's more like voice acting um, dependent, more like systems dependent. And uh, I'm not a huge fan of the, that way of thinking because the, because like, I think the way that like voice acting gatekeeps a little bit is that voice acting costs money. It costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And if you get you trained union actors or like actors with like big name recognition, that's going to take a lot of money. So I think prestige in narrative is as influenced by how much money you can throw around as much as like any other kind of game design thing, which is like, like, I mean, if you spend like a, like a million, few million dollars on graphics, then it's prestige. Like, mm -hmm. so it's like, it's definitely like a lot of the stuff I personally think is influenced by money. Um, whereas like, it's less impressive to put out a visual novel thing because people are like, Oh, you didn't spend so much money on it. And it's like, do you know how much mo how much money it costs to put like hundred thousand words of text into a thing um yeah so uh, it's a lot and uh, honestly i'm not even the popular voice on this I, actually you know what i'm on a queer podcast i guess it's just assumed that i'm not the popular yeah. voice on this <laughs> So what's something that you've noticed in your work as a narrative designer that you wish more people knew about? Um, yeah, I guess I guess it's about like tolerance for reading between the lines, right? Because like when mm -hmm. people like when people from AAA, like American AAA or like European AAA or Canadian AAA tell you about writing for video games is that you have to be as blunt as possible because no one pays attention to the text or the narrative. Nobody uh um you know when you're shooting things you don't want to hear about the story i'm just like looking at japan very awkwardly like seriously people debate these gray areas like people literally will start like putting together interviews and like start like debating over these nitty gritty tiny details about chronology and about like um things that characters were saying like on the surface versus what they weren't saying because of insecurity or something and it's like, mm. and it's like, I think we're projecting American culture onto like video games because I don't think gamers inherently do not want to read. I think it's that like for the English language audience, the industry has trained them not to read, has trained them mm -hmm. to not think about these things because like, I mean, like, I just, like, because when you look at, like, a lot of Japanese games that have text, a lot of VN elements, it's like, can you just imagine someone who is, like, just clicking through all the text, trying to get to the next bit of gameplay? Like, that just, like, for those <laughs> kinds of games where there's an audience that's kind of established, like, reading as, like, part of the game, they don't think of it like that. Like, honestly, when I first, like, was, like, exhibiting Lion Killer at, like, like game design programs at universities i literally saw people like clicking through the text yeah. i was like what are you doing i was like there's nothing there's just text there's nothing mm -hmm. there's only text like it was so distressing because i was just like yeah. i get that like capital g gamers are going to spend like thousands of dollars getting a game design degree but i was kind of like i was kind of like what's going on um yeah, uh, that would not have that does not happen with some friends I've given my game to, who are more used to playing Japanese games. Um, sorry, I'm, I know my eyebrows are like doing a lot of heavy lifting in terms of like, yeah, um, <laughs> weird. Um, yeah, I think it's really about acclimating people to like expecting good narrative. Like, I think it's personally very annoying when we still express shock at like, ooh, this video game has good narrative i'm like mm -hmm. um why did you expect it not to have good narrative it's kind of mm -hmm. like listen it's kind of like listening to the music in a video game and being like whoa the music is actually good it's like 
were you expecting the music <laughs> to be bad? Right. Um, so I think that's how we treat narrative, and it's really annoying. And we should just go in expecting every video game to have good narrative. Like we shouldn't be surprised when it does, because mm-hmm. that's like that just brings our field lower. And I think that it's yeah. like weird that we're like, ooh, like spicy it has a good plot mm-hmm. and the characters are like great and i'm just like okay um what did you come here yeah, for I, just I graphics it. or just like yeah, yeah like i mean i'm yeah. definitely guilty of this sometimes because i'm like whoa this game doesn't use any tropes and <laughs> i'm i'm just very guilty of this as well but i think we need to at least like try to have some expectations in terms of like hmm this story is not great, probably because they haven't hired a writer. Because, um, mm-hmm. like, yeah, because, like, a lot of the times it is game designers get to do that. And I'm just like, yeah. the writing is always the afterthought. Um, I mean, we're still in that, we're in that place where people are starting to realize that that's not the way to go. But it's still very much like we are definitely still treated as like something the game designer can do, which I'm like, if the game designer could write good narrative, then why do we have all these games, English language games that have not great narrative? Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that's kind of my thing. Um, yeah. Bring a lot of salty yeah. feelings to the forefront right now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just like, and I think it's so much of this is because Americans, especially those in the tech spaces um, who like, who um you know it's just like there's a lot of like disdain for visual novels um like you can't pitch like if you want to like get funding from an investment um from like a venture capitalist to fund your game because games mm-hmm. like an indie game can cost like a million dollars to make and that's mm-hmm. on like the middle low end that's not like there are indie games that cost a whole lot more and um when you're trying to get that kind of money from someone who is richer and like um from a very different background than you you say visual novel they're gonna pull back they're gonna get scared they're gonna be like this is not gonna make our money back and it actually happens with mobile too like mobile can make bonkers money on like visual novels uh text uh scrolling things and people will get people with who are like investors or like um, or like journalists or like um, basically anyone who works in the game spaces will get scared. Um, not all of them. There are a lot of journalists who do really, really, really great work with um, visual novel stuff. But like a lot of people from like, I guess, like the capital G gamer world will get very scared when you say visual novel. And it's like, but visual novels legitimize storytelling in video games. Like, what are you talking about? Like, if you really think about it, like, Ace Attorney, like Ace Attorney is a visual novel and a lot of people say it's not because they don't, they, cause they can't justify the fact that they like it. They're like, Oh, I liked Ace Attorney. So it can't be a visual novel. And I'm like, I got bad news for you. Mm. That was a visual novel. And you were clicking text <laughs> the entire time. Gotcha. Um, and like JRPGs, like, I'm sorry, those were visual novels. Like every JRPG you've ever played. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. awkward. It's just that like there's a lot of weird ego around the, those yeah. weird Japanese games, and it's like, and it's like, if you don't learn from people who have making games differently than you, then how are you going to get better? How are we going to be better about narrative games? It's very weird to me that when it comes to narrative, like American and like a Canadian, and well, basically, let's just say like. Um, the English language part of game development. So it's very weird to me that English language game development is very agnostic to like looking at successful narrative um, games and like very agnostic to looking at like because I w- I've I've been pounding this drum for so long about the fact that Fate Grand Order is like probably one of the best mobile mo- best narrative games on mobile right now and like right now it's mm-hmm. like. Um, but it's like a pure visual. It's basically it's like okay, not pure visual novel. There's some gameplay in it, but like the like narratively, the main way of delivering narrative is like reading text and like having seeing sprites of characters. And it's just yeah. weird to me that like when you look at when people are complaining about narrative games making money, I'm like, have you looked at mobile? Have you looked at how much money they make? Have you seen the fact that like like studios that make like 
text games about like romance are like doing well and they're not like shuddering and but everyone wants to be mm-hmm. like um they, people, but like i guess the prestige gamer with the capital g world wants to be like um wants to be like the last of us or like they want to like replicate telltale and i'm just like yeah. i'm just like but there's other stuff out there and if you just look at some of the games that have been successful like a lot of it is not like big prestige cinema and Mm -hmm. it's like i'm just like look japan taught players how to read like they literally taught generations (laughs) of players how to read Mm -hmm. we could do that it's not some kind of intrinsic asian thing it's like it's like a bunch of developers literally made these kinds of games for a very long time and like big huge companies like the ones who make like games like yakuza and like um and like the mm. square enix like they integrated those elements into their video games and like now people yeah. go into final fantasy expecting the story to have a good plot or at least a plot that's like you can tell a writer mm. was working really hard on it so mm-hmm. it's like why can't we just come in with the same expectations that we give to final fantasy and I, I just like, okay, we're just like willfully turning our eyes away at this point. So, um, yeah, mm-hmm. it's just been very, very strange. And it's like, we'd rather, it's like the English language industry yeah. would rather dig into some, like, some, like, like, really, like, like, unique and, like, never before seen way of doing narrative than, like, digging deep into what has made narrative really mm. popular. And, it's and i just like okay like we can't just use silicon valley's model of like move fast break things for everything like when there's a good thing going on we should just use that old thing and just start like building new innovations on top of old things (laughs) um but that's just how i personally feel about it and i am Mm -hmm. definitely not like the mainstream opinion I just wanted to go back to something you said earlier with the very beginning of our interview, which is that you felt as though queer folks and the queer community just um, were more willing to engage and uplift the visual novel as opposed to um, other folks. I was just kind of wondering um, if you wanted to say more about how you, what you felt like was the relationship between or the inherent queerness of visual novels. Oh, there's nothing inherently queer about it. Um, <laughs> sorry, getting your hopes up. Um, I noticed that actually, like a lot of people of color also do visual novel dev. Like, I like I've been attending like Game Devs of mm-hmm. Color Expo for two years. Um, it's an amazing conference. Frankly, it's just really amazing. What I noticed is that on the expo floor, there's a lot more visual novels or games that use visual novel elements to communicate story compared to like say the average floor on like most other um video uh, video game conferences and i think and i've been talking about this in in a different Mm -hmm. talk at neuroscope but i think the commonality is not necessarily anything about their the visual novel format necessarily as much as it is about that visual novel format is effective for delivering story and I think with marginalized people tend to want story more than people who are not mm. marginalized um, because it's kind of like going back to like the necessity of story. The idea that like story is some kind of luxury item because it's not. If it was a luxury item, then human beings would not have been telling stories for like since mm-hmm. the dawn of time. Um, so no, I don't think there's anything inherently queer about visual novels. I just think that it's more testament to how effective mm. it is as a medium to tell a story. Um, and also the sheer audio budget of trying to get voice actors and like trying to get someone who has a specialty in like doing the audio for voices and like, just like, you know, like the sheer complications of like trying to mess around with a, story format that's like kind of experimental at this phase because there's a lot of experimental narrative stuff going on but it's like a lot of it requires very dedicated equipment or dedicated software or like really like um like i've worked on a game that was kind of like gps dependent Mm. for like narrative and that was like not something that someone who could who um could just like one day decide to open up their computer and like make in their Mm -hmm. computer you know um 
so a lot of this is access, but also just like, like, I just think it's really like interesting how like we've decided that like, I guess from like the English language developer world has decided that cinematics is the way to go for narrative because I just think it's really interesting because I think cinematic is in a very inefficient way of delivering mm. narrative because I think cinematic is actually good. Mm. What it's good at is delivering mm. mood. It's about good at establishing like a feeling, but it's not good at delivering yeah. narrative. <laughs> like, um, I know I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for this, but like, it's just like, it's not like the ambiguity is the inherent strength of cinematics, but ambiguity hurts mm. narrative like but and, but when you just write something out of text or have someone deliver like lines that's a lot less ambiguous ambiguous than like showing a cut of someone's face being looking all sad at like some objects because that sadness could be about anything but if you have them speak then they can tell you why they are so sad or like the or they confront about like oh i'm sad about this and it's like no it's really yeah. something else Unfortunately, that's all we were able to capture on the recording of our conversation with CC due to those technical difficulties I referenced before. Uh, but CC was super generous and replied to questions we weren't able to get to in our discussion via email. Uh, so we're going to read through those now. Uh, obviously, it's not the same as having CC actually share this with us themselves, uh, but we couldn't pass up the opportunity to talk about this game that CC introduced us to called Botan Kados. Yeah, so Botan Kados. Baton Kaitos. It's hotly contested, however this game is pronounced. Um, but what is not contested is that it rocks. Um, so <laughs> Baton Kaitos came out um, in 2003, 2004 for the Nintendo GameCube. 2003 in Japan, 2004 in the US. Um, and essentially, uh, it's a Japanese role-playing game. But what's interesting about it is that you don't play as the protagonist the way you typically would in most JRPGs, but you're this self-proclaimed guardian spirit um, that is essentially interacting through the protagonist um, through these dialogue options. Like you have conversations with the protagonist and you try to influence the protagonist and like um, consult the protagonist, but you can't really ultimately control him. Um, and it kind of creates this like really interesting dynamic. Um, and so from time to time, uh, characters in the game will actually direct questions at you, the player, as the spirit, but it's really like the embodiment of you, the player, like in the game. Um, it kind of really makes it feel like the game is its own separate world existing outside of your control. Um, and so answering questions, um, in a rational manner that mirrors the respective characters mindsets mindsets strengthens their bonds with you um, and gives you benefits in the game's battle system. Um, but you could also, you know, answer in your own way and, and sort of uh, lead them astray or not strengthen those bonds. So, um, you know, outside of this indirect way of advising and guiding the flow of the game, um, the game plays as a traditional RPG with the director directing characters in the exploration of a game world and in combat against opponents. So, you know, you've got those typical RPG um, components, but this, this big twist of, of this really interesting narrative function. Just wanted to give y'all a little bit of a primer on, on what this game is all about. Definitely feel free to check it out. Um, but with that, we wanted to just sort of roll into the rest of the questions that we had for CC. Um, they had some really interesting responses to some of this. And so we wanted to make sure that we preserve that for y'all. So without further ado, Jamie and I will now proceed with the, our dramatic reading of the remaining interview <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, so our first question. CC, you wrote to us that the world building was weird and in some ways unapologetically queer in Bot and Kato's. Can you say more about how that manifested? CC responded saying, I think it was just the unapologetic weirdness of the setting. All of the character designs were super unique and it was often difficult to parse the gender of the NPCs. Nobody made negative comments about the men wearing makeup or anyone dressing oddly. In the sequel game, one of the main characters is admittedly non-human, but extremely trans in his gender presentation. All the main characters are pretty jokey with each other, but none of the jokes about him are gender-based. 
Um, so I definitely had a quick response there when Cece mentioned that um, in the sequel game, there's a one of the Marion characters who's non-human. I'm not sure if this is the character that Cece was referring to, um, but I had been reading about the game series myself, and there's this character called Guilo um, in the series uh, in a sequel to the first Spot and Katos. I have no idea if we're pronouncing this correctly. <laughs> um, but essentially, so Guilo is um, an arcane puppet uh, with the souls of a sorcerer and a sorceress bond to its body. Um, never addressed with any pronouns aside from it, um, Guilo speaks with masculine and feminine gendered voices simultaneously. In addition to its vocal style, Guilo interacts with others using a mixture of masculine, feminine, and non-human mannerisms, while Guilo seems to have on stiletto-like shoes and wears feminine body armor, quote-unquote, um, it is canonically a gender as it is a living doll. Hmm. So I just thought that, that was really interesting because like, even if the language isn't explicitly overtly referencing, like we said, trans rights in this game, um, you know, this character exists. I mean, I think that there's definitely like, I'm not saying that, Oh, a living doll referred to with it pronouns is trans representation, but um, because like that's a little too close to probably how cis people see me in my day to day. Um, but like, I do think you know, you wonder who who decided to put this here. Um, maybe I could romantically assume that maybe it was a queer person who could didn't have the option to say like, "Hey, this is a trans character," but instead put together figments that they knew would resonate with other people who had that shared reference. I don't know. Um, but, you know, yet again, 2003, trans people have always existed in and out of media, whether or not you want to acknowledge it. Um, so I just thought that was an interesting um, uh, a thing just around, um, you know, whether in fantasy or reality, like there's something about... Um, the mystery of queer and trans bodies that is mm. enticing for any kind of fantasy story. Um, and, and yeah, it's just, just cool to see. Yeah. 100%. Uh, the next question that we wrote to CC was, we can't talk about bot and Kados without mentioning the game's big twist over the course of the journey. So far, you have been the guardian spirit of Callus, who is on a mission for revenge for his slain family and joins forces with a girl hoping to take down an evil God. The twist comes when Callus, who you have spent 50 hours thinking of as your character, reveals he's working with the god for his own power and exercises you from his body. He literally turns to you on screen and says, your game is over. Go back to your world. What was your reaction to this moment when you played this game for the first time? Right. Yeah. So as you're saying, like you're a guardian spirit, you're not playing the main character. So CC says here, this was honestly my favorite cutscene from any JRPG. It relied on your assumption that you were in control of this story, only to be told that you were used by the narrative. I thought it was neat that the story was its own organism in a way. The twist in the sequel is even more interesting in that the player is a specific historical actor within the setting. It also betrays your expectations by weaponizing your knowledge of the first game. Um, so I think that's pretty cool, uh, just sort of the way that it kind of takes that through line into the sequel. Um, we're not going to be talking about the sequel <laughs> today, um, but... Again, just really awesome uh, narrative play there. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I, you know, full transparency, I had not even heard of this game. I'm not, I wasn't a Nintendo kid growing up, uh, mm -hmm. didn't have a GameCube. And so this game was not, neither, neither this game nor the sequel were on my radar at all. And when I read this bit about this twist in the game and, and just that whole fact of like, you being the spirit. I just thought that was such an interesting take that I feel like it's, it's interesting to me that we don't see that more often. Mm -hmm. Like games actually addressing the fact that it's a game you're an, that you're, that it's a game and that you're an outside influencer yeah. on uh, the things that are going on. Uh, I think so many games um, put us in positions of power mm -hmm. um, and, and are like feeding into this idea that you have full control in this space. And for a game to really actively say like, nope, you're, <laughs> you're an outside influence and we can exercise you if we want. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's really interesting as like a meta concept for the game. Yeah, I think that when people, you can also, it's shocking because you've been sort of groomed to feel as if you are the god. You are the master of the universe when you play a game. Like you are the greatest uh like you're this unstoppable force or or whatever it is um that you're that you are and this idea that um 
games don't need you to be worthwhile or to be um i don't know i think it's just a nice way of reminding gamers of putting us in our place <laughs> <laughs> yeah right like taking us down a peg yeah <laughs> okay so moving on to the next question um we continue on the topic of the this moment of betrayal in the game. Um, so the question states, this was an absolutely incredible mechanic because it not only is a betrayal of the player in the game, it's a betrayal of how video games are even supposed to work in general. The screen goes black, you're cast out, and you are jarringly reminded that this world exists independently of you. You are a witness. These characters are their own people with their own motivations. It begs the question of why we play games, to be in absolute control over a world? And when that expectation is subverted, is it to be reminded that we're not? What do you think? CC replied, I like JRPGs precisely because there's a lot of more stuff about fate and circumstances and not as much stuff about agency. Mm. I think it's a way to cope with the fact that we don't have control over most things in our lives. My own games have a sort of narrative about coping in disempowered circumstances. I think most of the time that's more relatable for young people living in 2020. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. Here, here. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do you feel like game? Like, I don't know if it's just my impression because I'm a child who is now an adult, and so I see the past through a child's eyes. But like, um, I just feel like games, the scope of them, have just seemed to have increased a lot in the past ten years. Like, I mean, like the emotional scope. Like, it seemed like. Like, even we were talking about God of War today, like, even the initial ones, I mean, I don't know, but uh, it seemed a lot more direct and a lot more about accomplishing, like, getting from A to B and being the strongest or just, like, getting through. Um, and it feels like a lot of the games now that I really, that really resonate with me are more about, you know, the world is painful and scary and it's full of powers that are so much bigger than you. But maybe if you try hard and work together, you can make the best of it. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think that's accurate. And I do think, yeah, whether or not the scope of games, I feel like we talked about this a little bit with Courtney too when they mm -hmm. were on, but just the idea that like it's games have gotten more emotionally complex, I think, mm -hmm. as time has gone on, as we've like, had more mastery over the technology of creating mm. games. There's like more space or thought going into what the game is actually saying or bringing us through as opposed to um, the technical impressiveness of mm -hmm. like the mechanics and what those can accomplish. And maybe I'm talking out my ass, but that's kind of like my perception of how mm. it's evolved. Um, and yeah, so like as we, it, it, and more people are making games now than ever before right so like as the industry like diversifies in that way and there's more space and time and thought and more people just getting involved it, i think it does create more experiences that can be like that that can be more less of like a yeah get from point a to point b this is what a game is and we can start to really explore more um more depth and more variety in the narratives that we tell <clears throat> and then i think like you and I maybe are particularly prone to like seek those kinds of narratives that are less about the A to B and more about all the in between. And then also like 2020 feels like a time where we have so little control that something about like seeing that reflected in our narratives and seeing characters and games uh, come together to overcome insurmountable odds, um, I think resonates a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I've just been isolated so much that I feel like the games have really saved me this year, like, uh, just for the escapism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think that if I was escaping into a world that wasn't as rich and wasn't as full of lessons for me about my own resilience and um, the importance of community and hope and all of these things, like, like a lot of these games have like dark storylines and scary, stressful times, but at their hearts there, there is this kind of through line of, but you can do it. Like you can get through. And 
I don't know. It's really interesting. Like I could be in a much worse mental state if I didn't have these lessons to lean on. Yeah. And I think like, at least for me, and I imagine you probably see yourself in this a bit too, but I don't find as much, uh, I don't get as much out of escapism that's just pure escapism or that's like a total distraction from what's going on in the real world or that's um, that feels more like fluff. Uh, when I think of the games that I've like resonated with the most this year, it's the games that have like made me think the most or been challenging or tough or like been talking about dark subjects. Like bug um, snacks. <laughs> just like bug snacks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just been um, it's, it's more ca- I think to feel mm-hmm. like you're, it feels less self-indulgent. I mm-hmm. think when you're, uh, you're trying to like have an emotional experience as opposed to just hide. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, next and uh, final question that we asked CC is what is the significance of Bot and Kados to you now? How has it changed uh, your life? So they say, I need to replay, but it's one of those games that reminds me that games can be and do anything. I don't need to explain the queerness or give people a transgender primer 101. I can just do the cool stuff and let the audience roll with it. Um, so yeah, I think that goes back to what we were saying earlier about um, you know these characters and their sort of unapologetic or unexplained queerness, gender queerness, whatever it is. Like, um, yeah, games can just kind of be whatever they want. And if you want to live in that world, then you play by that world's rules. And there's no one that you can complain to or stop and grill about their identity. So um, I, yeah, I love that. I love what they have to say about that. Absolutely. Uh, so if you want to keep up with CC, you can do that by following them on Twitter at S I X, the number six J I A N G or checking, checking out their website at S I Q I J I ang.com. They also have a Patreon where they're creating tutorials for game and interactive fiction writers. So if you're interested in those, you can go to patreon.com slash S-I-X, the number six, J-I-A-N-G. And that is it for today's session of Pixel Therapy. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope that listening to our thoughts and feelings gave you some thoughts and feelings of your own. If you enjoyed this episode, we would very much appreciate it if you could rate us and review us on your podcast application of choice. It makes a world of difference, especially for a little baby podcast like us. Do you want more Pixel Therapy in your life? Uh, Come check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash pixeltherapypod where you can get a monthly bonus episode for just $2 a month, plus opportunities to get involved with the community and influence the show directly. If you want to reach out to us, you can send us an email at pixeltherapypod at gmail.com, and you can stay up to date on all things Pixel Therapy by following us on Instagram and other social media at pixeltherapypod or by visiting our website at pixeltherapypod.com. Finally, as we end every episode, we'd like to share this week's recommended side quest. So December 3rd was International Day of Persons with Disabilities, which calls for us to promote the visibility, rights, and well-being of people with disabilities in all aspects of society. In honor of this important observance, we wanted to bring your attention to a really cool organization called Able Gamers. Able Gamers gives people with disabilities custom gaming setups, including modified controllers and special technology, like devices that let you play with your eyes, so that they can have fun with their friends and family. They're using the power of video games to bring people together, improving quality of life with recreation and rehabilitation. Um, Fun is something that we all deserve. And so you can read more about Able Gamers and donate to them at ablegamers.org. And that's A-B-L-E-G-A-M-E-R-S dot org. Thank you for that side quest, Spencer. That is our show for today. So go forth, run a story mission, level up some stats, and don't forget to hug an NPC every now and then. We'll be back soon with some more Pixel Pixel Therapy. therapy. E. 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 E